you know Jesus comment when looking for followers versus disciples and all of that when he says no one puts their hand to the plow and then looks back uh-huh. there's a context to that if you've ever been on a farm where there's old school plowing equipment i mean it's rugged it's ugly looking it's mm-hmm. i mean that blade has to dig into the ground through dry soil roots and all you in the heat of the day with this thing to control one of those you literally have to have your hands on at all times because it's a it's a horrible experience it's not fun at all yeah so literally if your hand if you are on that You've got to plow the straight lines for the fields. And if you go off, you start all over. Yeah. Because you've got to run those lines perfectly. Yeah. So literally what you had to do is you had to put your hand on that plow and you did not take your eyes off the oxen in front of you. Right. Because that thing had to move straight. You were the one. They were providing the kinetic energy, the, the movement going forward. You were the one keeping that plow. Steering it, yeah. Keeping it. You were doing less work than the the animals, but if you didn't do your job, you wasted the animal's time too. Even just the motion to turn around Mm. would put one of your arms at risk. And if you lost the depth that you were plowing in the ground, number one, you're in trouble. Number two, the likelihood of crossing into another lane. Stop, go back, replow the field. And so what Jesus is saying, basically, as a disciple is, listen, this isn't for the faint-hearted. If you can't do this thing and keep your eyes on this, it's not glamorous. But if you can't do it, don't even. And farmers would have gotten that and balked at the idea, what if one of my workers dared look around while their hands were on that plow? I'd yeah. whip him. We know that Barnabas was the encourager and Paul was a direct razor blade tongue. We know too that very sadly, the relationship between Paul and Barnabas falls apart completely yeah. over one significant event. Paul got tired of John Mark's immaturity. Yeah. So Paul says, I'm done with this. Basically, go home. You're a child. Yeah. Barnabas, who's not a seasoned rabbi, takes emotional, personal offense to that. He sulks. Paul reckons, well, you clearly don't pay attention. You go home with him. Yeah. Now, here's the sad part. Even sadder than the breakup of Paul and Barnabas is that years later, what do we read? In one of Paul's letters, he writes about a rabbi that will come and help that congregation. And what's his name? John Mark. His name is John Mark. And you're like, Wait a minute. Did Paul take John Mark back after he matured? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sadly, who don't we read about further, though, in that context? Barnabas. Barnabas. Which makes you think, well, who turned out to be right? Maybe Paul was doing the tough thing like a good sergeant major would so that you can survive. I mean... If you get into the war situation, you know better than I because I've never been in it. You can't wrap yourself in the fetal position and wait for your mother to come and stroke your head. No. And so you need that sergeant major figure. I've taken people back that I've intentionally put on their place when I thought. In fact, I had someone the other day ask me, why are you so hard on me? I don't see you doing this to other people in the context of our rabbinical studies. Mm -hmm. And my answer might not surprise you. I said, because I expect more from you. Yeah. Because you're capable of more. So either you're going to step up or you're going to fall down. So that's actually a compliment. If you're willing to take it, if you've got a thick enough skin, 